So today we're going to talk about journalism, or the lack thereof from the blogging industry. Oh yes, the people we're going to be talking about today are not journalists, because having the title of journalist would require them to do some actual journalism. Calling these people journalists would be akin to calling the fry cook at McDonald's a chef, and then complaining about how bad the food tastes. Now, it's pretty much common knowledge at this point that the top 10 lists that plague Google's search results are written by people who are just making them up as they go along. People who have barely any knowledge of the subject matter of which they're writing, save for a few products that their friends are selling, it's obvious why most top 10 lists are going to be shit. Most people writing them honestly aren't going to have the expert knowledge needed to know which 10 out of all JRPGs ever released are truly the greatest. Pro tip, Undertale isn't one of them. So let's look at something even easier. What's the easiest type of news piece to write? That's right, press releases. But I'm gonna show you how these 2-bit hacks can fuck those up too. What you're looking at is a visual novel called Kindred Spirits on the Roof, or Okujo no Yurirei-san as it's known in Japanese. In the visual novel scene, it's been known for some time now that if a VN has any sort of sexual content, said content will likely be cut from the Steam release so that teenagers can buy it. Granted, for most VNs, you could apply a patch to restore the censored content, but that's kind of a hassle, and there's always going to be someone who doesn't know better and ends up playing without applying the patches first. So when Manga Gamer announced that Kindred Spirits was going to be released on Steam completely uncensored, quite a number of people were ecstatic about this revelation. After decades of Japanese games coming over to the West with butchered localizations, things are finally starting to change. Of course, we saw multiple articles across a number of sites about this topic. Kindred Spirits on the Roof is bringing frank depictions of sex to Steam, said Andy Chalk of PC Gamer. Sexy lesbian ghost game comes to Steam uncensored, said Steve Hansen of Destructoid. And then we have Patricia Hernandez of Kotaku who wrote, Steam is getting an uncensored sex game, an article that has almost half a million views. Damn, son! Oh wow, this is an amazing step forward in the fight against censorship. Maybe now other companies will start to take notice, and they'll start releasing Japanese games without censorship too. Who knows, maybe we'll even see Sengoku Rance right next to the Hearts of Iron on Steam in a few years. <coughs> What's that? You have something to show me, Rain? <coughs> oh, you have some tweets by the translator for Kindred Spirits on the Roof? Well, let's take a look. At Tulip Goddess said, Hello, I'm the translator on Kindred Spirits. Just to clarify some stuff if you're wondering, hashtag Yuritopia. Yes, I would say sex is an important part of the game, but the focus is more on the relationships of seven different couples, living and dead. There isn't a ton of sexual content, and I wouldn't call it gratuitous, but it is sort of at the core of the story. Fun Kindred Spirits fact, the sexy scenes make up less than 5% of the script. I just checked, hashtag Yuritopia. And that's including some of the lead-in scenes with just kissing and chatting and stuff, too. Mamma mia! Further investigation into this title has revealed some interesting things. It seems that not only is this not a sex game, as Kotaku writer Patricia Hernandez claimed, but the sexual content in Kindred Spirits on the Roof isn't really pushing the envelope any more than plenty of other games on Steam. The thing is, the research needed to find this was really easy as the CGs from the VN had been on image archival sites for quite some time now. It wouldn't even take 5 minutes to search Okujo no Yuri Reisan CGs on Google and find this out. But no, the people writing these articles, some of them for sites that we once thought of as better than Kotaku, can't even be bothered to put in that much effort. This is because, as we said in a previous video, one thing above all else is valued when writing for these sites. Speed. The ability to write articles as fast as possible. Why? Well, because the first one to get their article out will more than likely get most of the traffic. And let's not even get into E3 coverage, where you have to hammer out the article in 10 minutes after the official announcement is released. And in that kind of time-constrained environment, it isn't so easy to do this kind of research. Often, it'll take a day or more to look into everything sufficiently for a good news article. But by that point, all of the clickbait sites have already got their articles out. So not only are you going to not get as many clicks as them, but your article will be driving even more traffic to their site as you attempt to refute any misinformation that they're spreading. This is true of pretty much all the professional blogs across the internet. Either they're behaving in this way, or they simply aren't making a profit at all. And yes, that includes the ones that you read that you think are 
are better than Gawker or Kotaku. The only exception to this are the sites that are not run for the purpose of making profit, though most of those are small-time blogs run by a single person. Now, the way in which most people assume these sites make money is through advertising deals, but that's not actually their main source of money. The main way these sites make money is through third-party investments, like when Peter Thiel invested $3 million in Pando Daily and $50 million in Reddit, you know, Condé Nast. So the people at the bottom of the totem pole at these companies the ones actually writing these articles, they're getting screwed out of the real money. Hell, most of them probably aren't even earning anything close to minimum wage for the time put in, even before it was raised to $15 in some states. Granted, that's their own damn fault for continuing to work for these shitty publications instead of getting a real job. Even shoveling camel dung at the circus would be more rewarding than writing poorly researched clickbait pieces. But even if all the writers on the internet suddenly came to this same realization unanimously, as many already have considering the high turnover rate of that industry, they would all be replaced in less than a week by a new generation of writers who are too stupid to realize what they're getting into. So you're probably asking yourself, what can be done about this problem if even a worker walkout wouldn't solve it? Well first off, I'll tell you outright that adblock is worthless, as these sites still pay their writers for clicks from adblock users, and they still get investment deals based off the traffic numbers partly influenced by the same adblock users. We need to deny these sites any traffic at all with the use of archival sites, or just, you know, not reading them at all. The problem with that is that just as writers are easily replaced, so are readers. Many of you probably remember a big online controversy a couple of years ago that showed much of the gaming community that Kotaku and Polygon owned by Gawker and Vox Media respectively, were awful sites that should not be trusted in any way. But the thing is, almost two years have passed since that controversy first arose, and in that time, an entirely new generation of young people have started using the internet, and many of them enjoy playing video games. These gamers have yet to learn, as we have, about how horrible Kotaku and Polygon and sites like them actually are. We must be the ones to inform the internet new fags with the knowledge of sites like Archive.is. Every time someone links or retweets an article from one of these awful sites on Twitter, it'll show up for a search for that site on TweetDeck. We have the power to sea lion every single one of these morons until they stop reading these sites. If we do it right, it could even become a running gag among some circles that anyone who shares a Kotaku article will be harassed by hundreds of anime and egg accounts. With their brand name directly tied with internet smack talk, not only will people stop reading these blogs, but investors will think twice before ever giving them any money ever again.